for aftercare youth. Um, so then we depended on the THPP Plus program. Now they're talking about cutting the THPP Plus program. Um, the HUD vouchers are very, very low in our county because so many people who are unemployed need those vouchers right now. Um, it's a domino effect. If you take this away from our youth, we have eight spots in smaller county, eight in Shasta, 15 in, in Butte. We average 15 plus youth waiting on that list in, just in Shasta. All eight of our youth are in college. All eight of our youth are now working part-time or full-time. And two of our youth are transferring to Sacramento State or and uh, San Luis Obispo. We, our goal is to keep youth off of CalWORKs. Our goal is to keep our youth employed and our youth goal is to make them independent and employed and contributing back to the society. So and by cutting this happy. program, yeah. you're gonna start a domino effect that's gonna affect everyone. So um, thank you for letting us speak out of the agenda because we do have to get back, so thank you. Thank you very much for all of your hard work. <laughs> thank you. So I think that completes at least this phase of public comment on the three proposed trigger elimination suggestions coming from the governor. And given that we're going to lose our quorum in just a few minutes, I'm going to suggest that we take the uncommon act of taking care of our votes necessary to complete today's agenda prior to hearing all of the presentations from the departments, from finance, from the LAO, and from our stakeholder groups. But that does not suggest that all of the material has not been read and digested by committee members. And of course, uh, the recommendations that we are going to be considering in these motions have come from staff consideration as well. So, uh, Senator Alquis, I'm going to make the motion that we completely reject the governor's remaining trigger elimination proposals, both for CalWORKs and for the THP Plus program. I concur. Thank you very much. And with regard to THP Plus, I think we all understand the great risk of homelessness, alcohol and drug abuse, and incarceration for our foster youth. And they are our, the state's foster youth, and we need to take responsibility for them. And when we see that THP Plus participants experience a 19% gain in employment, and a 13% increase in hourly wages, in addition to advances in education and health and housing stability, this program is essential. And again, it is just stunning to me that Arnold Schwarzenegger would want to kick to the streets our foster youth. It makes no sense whatsoever. So those are actions uh, relative to pages 23 through 25 and 25, 26. So then on pages 28, 29 is the issue of IHSS anti-fraud positions and I'm going to make the motion that we reject the request for six new positions and hold open the requested funds for the contract related to anti-fraud study. That will be the action of the committee. The next issue which we'll come back to IHSS Conlin versus Shrewry positions. Uh, we're going to take no action on that. And I believe that takes us to the end of our agenda. So Senator Alquist, thank you for being with us today. I know the public appreciated your comments and your participation. Thank you for your leadership. Okay. So now we are going to return Mr. Garcia to the THP Plus and uh, do not think that your comments uh, are any less valued by the committee, even though we've already taken our action. <laughs> um, thank you, Senator. And, and let me begin by maybe making a couple of comments that I intended to make at the beginning of, of, um, of the hearing that I didn't make. Um, the governor's budget is the beginning of a very long process, as you know. It, it comes out in January. Uh, I think there's an opportunity for the legislature to consider the proposals in the governor's budget, accept them, reject them, make alternative proposals. And then in May, there's a revision that will be coming out that will provide some additional information. I think you indicated earlier, the SEO has indicated there's additional revenue. That'll be considered. 
and, and there in fact have been some successes in getting additional federal funding. The department has worked very hard to bring additional federal funding into the state and we've had some successes. Um, so I think that, that our expectation is that the May revise, in fact, will have some modifications to proposals. And, and with that then, talking about THP+, Plus, that particular program in the trigger proposals would be eliminated beginning January 1st. The funding would be eliminated for the entire budget year. So from our perspective, rather than begin today to take actions to uh, eliminate or reduce a program that we've heard, worked very hard, the administration has worked hard to expand over the last several years, um, our intent would be to wait and see what the May revise looks like. If it looks like the trigger is going to be pulled, at that point, I think then we would begin to take more specific actions. We've had some discussions with counties. We've, we've, we've had discussions with the California Youth Connection and others to make them aware of the proposal. I think if it becomes pretty evident that the trigger is going to be pulled, then we would begin to take more specific actions. And we agree there would be some devastating impacts to some of the kids that are in this program now. And we would prefer not to see that happen. Thank you, Mr. Garcia, again, for your forthrightness. And my only response would be, again, not to you, but uh, directly to the administration, that the unintended consequence of even proposing to the state the elimination of funding for THP+, plus, and I know this because I've heard these stories directly, that there are foster youth who have already dropped out of school, scrambling to find a job, because they know the 6.9 billion in federal funds are not going to come, and they believe the governor when he says he's going to pull a trigger yeah. and yank their housing from them. So lives have already been redirected just because of the ill-conceived proposal put forward. So unfortunately, he needs to understand what happens when he proposes something, whether he intends it or not. To say it's the beginning of a conversation may make sense here, but in the outside world, People are losing sleep and redirecting their lives as a result of it. And I appreciate your comments that it probably does make more sense for us to wait for the May revision before we start devastating the infrastructure of our social safety net. And as we've heard today, impacting mostly California's most vulnerable children. So if when the governor vetoes $4.1 billion worth of budget solutions, which he's already done because we haven't made deep enough cuts now prior to knowing what our situation will be in May. I hope he can reconsider and realize that the smartest way to approach this 20 billion mountain that we're climbing is to chip away at it as we can. So if we've got 4.1 we put on his desk, sign those bills, Governor, and claim $4.1 billion in success, then We'll continue to add to the two billion, hopefully, in unexpected revenue, unprojected revenue. Maybe that'll get us to eight billion. And who knows what we'll get from the federal government. Maybe it will be four, maybe it will be five. So before we start destroying the lives of Californians, we could resolve 13 billion or so and then get to the hard work of finding a thoughtful, compassionate way to deal with the last seven billion. But to tell us you're vetoing these budget solutions now because we haven't cut deep enough. It almost sounds kind of sadistic. So uh, finance and LAO with regard to the proposal to eliminate funding for THP plus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sun Park with the Legislative Analyst's Office. As you've already mentioned, um, former foster youth do face significant challenges once they age out of the foster care system. So we think it's important to provide some level of support and services to this group of young adults. Um, therefore, we would be against eliminating complete general or completely eliminating general fund support for this program. That said, given the general fund condition, the legislature may wish to consider a lesser reduction or perhaps instituting a county share of cost for the program. Thank you, LAO, we appreciate that. Finance, no? Okay. And with that said, I think we can have our stakeholder group join us for this third and last panel. And then I see we have any number of folks who have been very patient with us, who are lined up to make use of our public comment time, and we will get to every last one of you. So for the stakeholder panel for THP+, just to completely 
and more comprehensively understand exactly what the governor's proposal would do to California, we ask to rejoin us Frank Mecca, Terrell Williams, Amy Lemley, Jim Roberts, and once again, Kelly Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mecca. Uh, Mr. Chairman, at the risk of uh, overexposure, I'm Frank Mecca with the County Welfare Directors Association. Never, never. <laughs> Thank you. Now I'm blushing. <laughs> um, and in the interest of time, there, there are experts and recipients who can tell you the story about why this program is so critical. Um, I would just like to point out that this is it's a critical part of a continuum of services, and that continuum was harmed significantly last year by an $80 million general fund, $120 million total fund veto um, of the child welfare program that came as a surprise to stakeholders and um, from what we could tell the legislature as well. So the cut uh, the, uh, to THP is on top of um, a cut to a program that is uh, threadbare to begin with. And um, CWDA and many of the organizations that are here today have stickers on. We're part of a coalition, Protect Our Children and Our Future. And uh, you'll be hearing more from us in the coming days and weeks. And our message to you is simple. Uh, fully fund child welfare, no more cuts, and absolutely do not cut the THP program. And the witnesses that you'll hear from uh, will tell that, give you the reasons um, uh, for that. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. much. Mecca. Mr. Williams. Hello. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and the members. My name is Terrell Williams, and I'm part of the San Francisco, I'm part of California Youth Connections, San Francisco chapter in Alameda. I go to City College of San Francisco, and I'm currently in THP Plus program, Larkin Street Youth Services. And through the THP Plus program, it has given me a safe place to live and the time I need to develop myself as an adult. They have provided me with the tools that I need to transition into my in, into my own independent like how to save money and pay bills. They help me in the long run when my two years are up and I will get all the money back that I've paid in rent to go and buy my first place. And if the THP Plus program ended, I would end up homeless, I would drop out of school. I, it would be very difficult because I'd have to worry where I'd have to lay my head at night. And it would be very difficult for me to find work because if I don't go to school, I won't have the necessary qualifications to get a job that will pay good. These cuts would affect 14,000 other youth who depend on these services now. What would happen to the future foster youth that emancipate out of care? They're expecting these THP plus programs, but if they get cut, where would they go? They would end up on the streets. And so, sorry about that. No, you're doing great. Um, in 2001, THP plus programs and the help of collaborating support services housing, Larkin Street Youth Services, California Department of Social Services, and California Youth Connections has all made this possible to what it is today. Let's not move the clock back, let's keep it going forward. And that's all I have to say on this. Topic. Thank you, Mr. Williams, you're a very articulate spokesman, and we wish you continued success for your studies, and we're gonna to fight to keep you in your program. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker is Ms. Lemley. Thank you, Chairman Leno. My name is Amy Lemley. I'm with the John Burton Foundation. And I'm here today um, both as representative of the, the John Burton Foundation and it was one organization that is participating in the broad-based statewide coalition called uh, Protect Our Children, Protect Our Future that's working to uh, prevent any uh, reductions in child welfare. Um, as we know, uh, THP Plus was created in 2001 to uh, ensure that youth who are aging out of care make a safe, supported transition. Um, and since then, California has made tremendous gains. We now have 1,400 young people who at any moment are receiving affordable housing and supportive services through THP+. Um, so in terms of some young people will be affected by this cut, every one of those young people will be made homeless. A criteria for participation in THP+, is having a serious housing need and or being homeless. And so who are these young people? These are young people from 52 counties. 12% of these young people are custodial parents, some of them with two children. 6% of these young people have a serious physical or mental disability that qualifies them for SSI. So these young people are already on the edge. This is a program that's providing them with tangible support to help them move forward in their lives. Um, and as you said in your introduction to, uh, to the hearing, um, it's a program that is making a difference. The, out of all the outcomes um, that it has produced, the ones that we at the John Burton Foundation are the most excited about is the effect it's having on education. When young people enter the program, 
less than a quarter are holding a high school diploma. So less than one in four young people even have this minimum academic credential, which makes them, and without their, that, they're completely irrelevant in, our, in today's economy. At the point of exit, however, 62% are holding a high school diploma. At that point, they're positioned to participate in our economy, they're positioned to enter higher education, and really enjoy the California dream we want for our own children and for every young person in foster care. Uh, we feel this is a very strong program, and there has, in fact, been a cost-benefit analysis conducted. This analysis- We was, like that. Yes, um, <laughs> and it's been conducted by Professor Mark Courtney, not specifically of THP+, but the analysis was conducted of the benefits of extending support for youth after age 18. And we know that for every one public dollar invested, there's a $2.41 return on investment. Um, and so imagine that kind of uh, return on investment in the private sector. We would all want to put our money there. Um, and that's where California should be putting its money, not reducing its investment, not threatening young people with homelessness, and um, as you so aptly put, turning the clock forward. So we uh, appreciate your rejection of the governor's proposal and look forward to working with you together on the coalition. Thank you, Ms. Lemley. Let me say that uh, we know our good friend John Burton doesn't take kindly to compliments, but let me suggest that the work of his and your foundation compare equally to Senator Burton's extraordinarily successful legislative career, and we really appreciate the mountains that your foundation has moved, including the accomplishment of uh, Senator Boxer's extending foster care services uh, beyond age 18 at the federal level. Thank you for that. Mr. Roberts. Um, yes, Chairman Lano, thank you for the opportunity again to speak to this, I think, very important issue. My name is Jim Roberts, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Family Care Network. I'm also a board member of the California Alliance of Child and Family Services. Uh, my organization has been serving the California Central Coast, Santa Barbara, and San Luis Obispo counties for 25 years. Most of that is an FFA where we work with transitional age youth, but we began serving um, uh, in specifically THPP program in 1999 and then the PLUS program in 2004. You know, this is an enormously successful program and it, we've served over 100 kids in our PLUS program um, and 94% of them have successfully moved on to independent self-sufficiently, sufficiency. That's a remarkable, you know, statistic. They could be, you know, we could be paying for them in other ways. This last November, we had four youth leave, each of them with savings of over $8,000 that we were able to help them patch together through savings matches, through incentives, through the constant one-on-one -on -one work that we do with these clients. I've spent nearly 40 years working with foster youth. Uh, 15 is a probation administration, administrator and the rest of it working uh, with my organization. And, and I remember very clearly those days when foster youth aged out and were loaded in vans and taken to the homeless shelters or they were sent to say, go find a friend, or they moved back with the, with the families or the people that had abused them or were just wished a nice life. And, and this is a life-saving program. Literally, it is a life-saving program for these kids. Um, Amy clearly identified the target population. Um, you know, all of the, the young people that have come to us, they've been homeless. They've come, they were living on, in, the, in the parks, they were living in the laundromats, they were living in cars, they were couch surfing, and we've been able to pull them in, provide them the services to really move them onto successful, positive, you know, living and, and abilities. And, and I think that that's so important. The, the fact is kids are in TH Plus because they, are, they don't have any other options or resources available to them. If they did, they would be exercising them. I don't think they really want to be continued under some kind of public assistance or support, but they really need it. And, and I really um, encourage you, if you haven't read, um, uh, Mark Courtney's study about the, the really the cost-benefit analysis, it, it, we are in fact saving the state money by providing these services. We are not costing the state additional dollars, and I think that's so important for us to consider. 
As a provider, I think you, you need to be aware of too that there's potential impact. If, if this program is cut, then I'm gonna be pushing staff into the ranks of the unemployed. But there's also another issue. In order for us to be more cost effective in the delivery of our services, we've purchased living units, apartment complexes using the EHAP CD process. What do we do with those facilities without clients or resources to support them? I mean, because you know, they have very narrow, limited use, and we, as long as we stay within the parameters, we're fine. But the program goes away, what, what do we do with these apartment buildings? I mean, it, 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 and there are many organizations like ours that have made uh, substantial efforts to reduce costs so we can serve more kids. And in, in our programs, we're serving way more kids than we have state allocated slots because we're being cost effective and because we're doing the best to keep our costs down so we can serve more than what the allocations are. And I think that's a consideration here is that we're giving more bang for the buck as providers. Um, and, and I'd like to just conclude you know, with one, one comment, and that is one of my, my most favorite quotes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a World War II martyr. He said that the, the true test of a civil society is how it is seen in history as taking care of his children. And my challenge to you and to the governor and to the legislature is that let us be remembered for properly taking care of our kids and not trashing them and dumping them out into the streets with no resources. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. The image of empty apartment houses and youth living in parks across the street will stay with me. Ms. Brooks. Kelly Brooks on behalf of the California State Association of Counties. I'll try and be very brief. Um, obviously counties are concerned about the well-being of this population and concerned that with the elimination of the program that many of the youth will um, end up in the county safety net or what's left of it at this point um, and shift costs to other systems. You know, we're, we're obviously as many as 1,400 um, youth would be um, homeless sort of the day that the, the program gets eliminated. Homelessness um, is estimated to cost society about $40,000 per individual. Um, in addition to homelessness, um, a portion of the youth um, currently served by THP um, may also qualify for county general assistance programs. Youth who have emancipated from the foster care system have a very challenging time finding employment. Studies show that two to four years out of the, of the foster care system that emancipated, uh, that over half of um, emancipated foster youth are unemployed. Um, this program has been key to turning around some of the, the bad outcomes that um, folks cite over and over again um, associated with um, the foster care system, and we would just encourage you to um, oppose the governor's proposal. Thank you. Thank you once again for your thoughtful presentation and uh, chock full of good data. Thank you, stakeholder panel. And we'll now ask our general public to come up to the microphones at the tables. So we can hear from you, and again, given that we still have business before us, if you could be respectful of the time that you speak, hopefully keeping it to a minute or two. I know you've traveled a long way to be here, and we're glad that you are. <coughs> Welcome. Um, Leno and Senator Ashburn uh, and the members of its affiliates and everyone here today. Um, I apologize for my voice um, as of this time I am suffering from a cold but that did not stop me from coming here to speak to you today. Um, my name is Christina Marie Kell and I am a foster youth from Placer County and I'm here to represent uh, the THB at, uh, Plus uh, Transitional Housing Program uh, that I am affiliated with. Um, I feel very strongly upon it and I wanted to discuss with you some of the benefits that has offered myself and many of our foster care youth. Um, among several of the benefits, again, discussing the housing needs, they're able to adequately, more so than adequate, provide us with safe uh, housing, adequate housing. Um, also in addition to that, the offer, services that are offered and rendered are more so um, a support in addition to uh, maintaining uh, a proper residence and home, um, also life skills pertaining to uh, cleaning, maintenance, care, as well as uh, daily tasks as balancing a checkbook, uh, managing your savings, your time, things of that nature that are important for everyday youth. Uh, in addition to that, you have your mentorship and your friendship that is offered from the, um, again, the counselors and the 
uh, THP plus uh, transitional housing pair providers as well. Uh, they're always there in a moment's need, any questions, comments, or concerns. They're there to support and assist the youth in all matters and natures. Um, in regards to scholastic endeavors, they're very supportive, again, with the needs of textbooks, of writing materials, utensils, and the support ser services thereof. Um, THP Plus is more than just a housing program. It is a life force. It is a provider for those who have none. If the state takes this program away, essentially, myself, several of our youth that you see, will be left homeless. We will be without scholastic skills. We will be without work skills, without skills that will make us productive individuals of society. By having THP Plus, it breaks that cycle of abuse, of violence. It breaks the cycle of falling into our parents' footsteps. THP Plus provides us that stepping stone, that pathway, that window of opportunity to a better life. My, myself, uh, thankfully, um, I actually go to school three quarters of the time. I work full time, and I've actually recently received a, uh, a supervisor position at Macy's, which I've been lucky to receive. So I will be one of the full-fledged members able to continue on with the life skills that I've learned through the THP Plus program through Placer County, able to continue on my education, and to ably and substantially support support myself and be a productive member of the society in more ways than one. And so I'm here today, senators and chairs and affiliates and everyone, to stress the importance of THP Plus and what it offers and what it provides. It is so much to the youth, to myself, and to all of California. And I am just um, here on behalf to request that, that this be acknowledged and presented and all the importance and of what it offers to the youth and for Arnold Schwarzenegger also to realize that. And thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Continued success, Christina. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Oh, okay. My name is Kendra. And it's really nice to meet you guys. Um, just this program has done so much for me. I never wanted to actually be in a program after being in foster care, but um, it took me a month and a half of trying to find an apartment and actually get on a lease that made me go look elsewhere for help. Could not get on a lease anywhere because I didn't make three times the amount of rent. Um, so I did look and I did find, you know, Ruth and ILP and THP Plus and she helped me and I got my place and, um, you know, helped me build a resume and get a good job. Now I have, you know, I'm licensed in insurance. I saw all state. I have, you know, I've been going to school. I have two years of college, uh, you know, down now and I've just, I, I don't know where I would be if I didn't have this program. I would be homeless, and I would have not accomplished anything that I have so far. Great news. Thank you. Continued success. Hi, I'm Courtney. Um, I've been in THP Plus for a year <coughs> next month, and I'd like to just start off. I'm not only just a fo former foster youth. I'm a growing adult in society, and I don't use what I've been through as a crutch to hold me back, but as a stepping stool to get ahead. And without this program, I would be homeless. Two days after my high school graduation, I was emancipated, and instead of celebrating my success, I was living in fear of not knowing where I was going to go and what I was going to do with starting Fresno State in the fall. And with this program, it's not only a financial needs situation, but it's also emotional support. I love my case manager. She's pushed me completely to my full potential of what I can do and has really opened up doors for me. It's been a struggle. I've gotten to the point where I've broken down and been like, I can't do this anymore. I'm putting my hands up in the air. I'm done. And I'm so surprised to this day to see that I've gotten this far. I'm now 20 years old, almost done with my second year of college, and I'm going to school to be a social worker and give back to my community in the way that it's given to me. And I can't stress the importance of how important it is to have this program in this community because it really does give back the people that are in it get back more than what it gives. And it's just really important that this does not get cut. And I really hope, you know, as you guys did, you guys passed to not cut it. And I thank you for that. Great testimony, Courtney. Thank you. Look forward Hi. to your graduation day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My name is Sandra. I'm from <coughs> Fresno, California. I'm, I'm a former foster youth and THP Plus now. And uh, when I graduated, I was in my mind, I was thinking about moving back to my mom's. And then that's not a good place for me to be because they get into drugs, whatever, depend on welfare, cash a check, and that's all they look forward to. Um, but then being in the program, it helped me be independent. Um, my whole family comes to me for advice. They, I'm the one that's achieved a lot. Um, I've 
been to school. Well, I graduated with my diploma. I went to cosmetology school and graduated, and now I'm planning to get back in school. But without the program, I would have moved back with my mom's. Most likely, she would have kicked me out sooner or later and, you know, would have been homeless. But the program helped me um, think the right way and helped me get my mind out of the way my family was thinking. Because for a minute, I was in their way of, like, living. I was going to probably get pregnant. Who knows? But then the program helped me a lot in life. But without it, yeah, I'd be just like my mom and a statistic. All right. The program. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks for coming today. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay. Uh, my name is Kevin Sang. Um, I'm a former foster youth. Um, I would like to add that if this program will be cut, most of us youth will be starving and probably be homeless. Some of us might be even committing crimes in the streets, you know, who knows, doing drugs. So I'd just like to say that just don't cut this program off. It's helping me. We hear you. Thank you, Mr. Sang. Um, my name is Chris Nell. I'm in the THP housing program. Uh, before this program, I was actually homeless. So I would think that after, if this program is cut and I'm not with it anymore, I would be homeless again. There's no reason for me to believe I wouldn't be. Um, while I was in this program, I actually got a job. I have had a, my third job in this program. And um, I mean, I'm paying taxes like everybody else. So I believe that if I'm going to be paying taxes, my money should be going somewhere where, you know, I wanted to go help other people out. So people like us really need the tax dollars that we do pay for this kind of stuff. And it's not like you're giving up money because you're actually making money in return from it. So I think THP should stay. I don't see why some people up there don't really realize that, mainly Schwarzenegger. But um, this, this program really needs to stay. It benefits a lot of people. Thank you, Chris. All right, my name is John, and uh, I'll make this short. I want to speak out for all the foster kids that are in foster care about emancipate. That the impact of cutting this program will affect the youth that are coming out of foster care. Most of their youth have nowhere to go and no family to go to. Out of experience that I have been through, majority of foster youth end up being homeless or turning to the streets, ending up locked up or maybe dead on the streets. Having a THP program give us a chance to get our life going and doing something that might help or benefit the community. Speaking for myself, THP have gave me a place to stay, was able to help me and gave me a job and taught me how to be independent. Without THP, I would be running the streets just to survive day by day basis. So I ask that this program don't be cut. Thank you, John. Hello, my name is Luis. I'm with the THP program. And if y'all cut this program, it would have been like, I've been in foster youth for like 10 years or now I'm out, I'm in the THP program. Mm -hmm. If you cut this program, I probably would have went back with my family. And that whole 10 years that y'all tried to help me would have been for nothing. So we're all going to be saying the same thing. So I'm just going to make this quick. Appreciate it. Keep this program. And I'll vote for you, too. Thank you, Louise. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everyone's registered to vote. <laughs> um. Hi, my name is Marquita Jones. I'm from San Francisco. I'm currently living in a THPP program. I'm a former foster youth. And um, I've actually experienced, you know, being homeless. Um, when I graduated and stuff, I had started at one program. I reconnected back with my birth mother. And, um, and you know, I ended up losing my job and just all sorts of things because my mother has bipolar. So she doesn't take care of me. I take care of her. And, um... Most people my age, they have a, you know, when you first move out, people make mistakes. They go home a lot, but I don't have that option. Without THPP, without the program, I'm at least, without at least, I don't know where I would be right now. And I'm, I've seen a lot of my friends that was in foster care with me and that's been in group homes and foster homes with me. They don't have a place to go right now. And all they're doing is crime or just, you know, basically couch surfing or being bums. And I really don't want that for myself. I graduated high school. I, I worked for um, Children's System of Care. I try to get back to my community. I don't feel like I deserve, you know. To, to end up homeless or without the stuff I need. Already the budget cuts for the program already has like, normally you get new furniture and stuff when you move in with lease and stuff, but because they this stuff got cut, I don't even have that right now. But I don't care because I appreciate the roof over my head, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just really please don't cut the program because I don't know where my life is. I already have odds stacked against me. I don't need 
something else to try to bring me down. I'm trying to elevate myself. I want better for myself. And I feel like we all deserve better. And we don't deserve any less chance than any any other child that grew up in here. Parents or not. Or we, we deserve a chance. And taking us out of our homes... It's just it's cutting us it's cutting us down. It's making it where it's gonna be so hard for us to make it in a world that's already so hard for just it's already hard. We don't need it to be harder. Thank you. You should think of running for public office. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, how y'all doing today? Uh, my name is Deville Joyner from San Francisco, also in the TSP program. Um, I mean, I'm gonna be very brief. Um, basically, everything they said is is true. I mean, if you cut this program, a lot of Kids, a lot of young youth behind me won't have anything to look for. I mean, I've been through a lot with my parents, too, with drugs and foster care and all things like that. And, you know, I just moved into the TSP program about a month ago, you know, so I'm barely getting into it and I'm looking for a job now, like that close to getting it, that close. So, I mean, this program helps out a lot. It helps out a lot, a lot, you know. Um, Probably after I graduated out of high school, I probably wouldn't know where I went. I mean, I lived with my auntie for a while, but things were getting so hard on her to where it was like I didn't want to be there anymore just so that she can take care of my little cousin and stuff. So, I mean, just, you know, for Echo, please, 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 please do not cut this program. I mean, it means a lot to me, and I think it means a lot to a lot of people here. That's why we're here today. So yes, thank you, and have a good day. Thanks for being here. Hey, I want to thank you for your time. My name is Ted Masters. I emancipated from the foster care system back in June, and I've been in the Placer County TLP, uh, THP Plus program since. I was skeptical at first, but they've helped me um, get two jobs. The recession took one of those away. Um, they've helped me stay in school, pay, pay to keep my truck on the road, and, and keep straight and out of trouble. You know, um, I work, I work part-time, and I go to school full-time. I'm trying to get in the Coast Guard to become a helicopter pilot and uh, also elevate my life. And, um, you know, if THP Plus uh, ends, that's, that's going to cut that, you know, a lot of those dreams for me. I don't want to go from a nice apartment to sleeping on the steps of Salvation Army, you know. I, I love camping, but I'm not trying to make it a lifestyle. And, uh, I hear you. I, I didn't have the choice of having, you know, I, I didn't have a, a father or mother. And the state is my dad and my mom. Um, my grandpa, my grandma, and I, you know, I, I just hope that they would be there for me like, you know, I hope hopefully will be there for my kids. So I want to thank you again for your time. This has been a long meeting. I'm sure you guys are exhausted. And take care. Thank you, Mr. Masters. No? Uh, how you doing? First, I just want to say, pleasure to meet you, Leno. <laughs> nice to meet you. What is your name, sir? Uh, my name is Jay Cage, and I'm a participant in THP+. Plus. And uh, first, I want to emphasize, you know, the importance, the positive impact, you know, THP has had in my life. And before that, I want to acknowledge THP plus not existing and where I would be, which is hard, only because I know I would not have a job. I know I would not have a housing. I know I would not have people to support me. To begin with, uh, I've been neglecting my whole life, my whole family. So to uh, hear that the state wants to cut this whole budget and all that, it kind of feels like it's coming back on me, the neglect. So I want to acknowledge, acknowledge that. Um, as far as I also want to say as far as THP and as far as what it's taught me. Um, it's taught me, well, I don't have time. How about this? <laughs> it's taught me how to employment, how to dress, how to go to interview. It's taught me how to, you know, speak, how to, you know, what they're looking for. It's taught me how to be independent, reliable. It's taught me how to, you know, persistent, how to be, you know, it's, mainly self-discipline, you know, discipline myself, how to make do my make. Cause now I have my own house. I have to make sure I wash my own dishes. I have to wash my clothes. I have to go to school. I got to go to work. I got to make sure I can have my meetings and dealt with. So that's all prioritizing. That's not something that you just wake up and learn overnight. <laughs> so the uh, main thing I want to just acknowledge, I want to make it brief because a lot of people, you know, here have met the, de the deadlines. Um, I'm, a, I'm a soon to be father now, I found out. So... It may, just to find out that not only am I jeopardy, you know, from, you know, I'm all stressed out from the baby, you know, how's it going to be? And to find out that I'm in jeopardy of my housing, it, you know, makes me feel like that's my son's housing. So mm -hmm. it makes me push a little bit harder. I woke up early. I got dressed up nice, you know. Like I said, I'm <laughs> <laughs> happy to see you. So. You're looking good. Thank you. And so I just want to make that clear. And also, you know, I want to make it clear that, you know, 
GHP Plus is, you know, open for diversities. You know, I'm Latin myself, so it made me it made me open myself and see myself as a different person. You know, I have people to support me. You know, I got adults that you know I can go to if I have an issue. You know, I could go relate to them, and to have somebody relate to me like that, you know, makes me feel like there's a world out there for me. You know, if that makes sense. <laughs> and there is, and there is. Thank you very much. Congratulations. You're going to make a great father. Thank you. All right. My name is Peggy Perry, and I'm a manager of one of the lease, uh, one of the programs, the THP Plus programs in San Francisco. We have 30, uh, 53 units, and we have 53 youth in the program. Uh, for every bed that might open, we have a slew of youth that are wanting and needing to get into it. So we really have our pick of which youth uh, come into the program, although different beds uh, accommodate different types of uh, pictures. Some may be a, a parent, some may be uh, require a male match, that type of thing. I'm so proud of the youth that are in here today that uh, spoke because I, I couldn't possibly say anything that would uh, help the cause better than what they, they've done. Um, I will say, though, that all, out of the uh, 53 youth uh, in our program, uh, at least 16 of them are parents. And out of those 16 uh, uh, parents, including the non-custodial parents, uh, that represents 25 children. Uh, and uh, these, these kids are busting their tails to take care of their kids. Um, and um, some of what I've seen them do in, way, in the way of sacrifice when we uh, were faced with some prior cuts was just really astounded me. I mean, some of the kids actually went from having $135 per month to eat on, and now they're stretching $75 for the whole month. You know, I, I live well. I, I spend that every two days, so I just don't get it. Um, as far as investment, um, what they've been giving even while in the program uh, has been just enormous. And I, I worked, practiced social work for 30 years, and I came from a state that didn't have uh, this program. I'm also a licensed foster parent in that state. You guys, uh, you have no idea where you're going to be taking these kids if this program gets cut. Uh, I worry about my former foster daughter every night. But I, I thought I didn't have to worry about these kids. Thank you, Ms. Perry. We're watching out for them. Hi, I'm Dina Wilderson from Larkin Street Youth Services. Um, Larkin Street is the leading provider of services to runaway and homeless youth in San Francisco. <laughs> Last year, we provided housing and support services to 3,600 youth, and over 60%, that's over 60% of this is estimated homeless and marginally housed youth. <coughs> the link between foster care and youth hom homelessness has been well documented. Half the youth we serve through our continuum of services were previously in the foster care system. And the majority of these youth, 56% of them, aged out of the system upon reaching age 18. Larkin Street became a THP Plus provider because we saw an opportunity. The chance to change the path of the numerous foster care youth who emancipate from the system at age 18 with no place to go. We saw far too many being dropped off at our emergency shelter with garbage bags full of their belongings in hand. In many ways, those were the more fortunate ones. Others simply landed on the street. Larkin Street has been able to provide housing, independent living skills, educational support, and employment services to 204 youth since we began as a THP Plus provider in 2004. And these programs are effective in helping former foster youth transition to stability and independence. Last year, 83% of the youth who exited our two programs successfully transitioned to stable living situations, and they did so with improvements in employment skills and educational advancement. THP Plus is a safety net for youth who leave state care unprepared to live on their own. Elimination of THP funding would land these youth in homelessness and back on the path that we'd hope to change for them. Thank, thank you, you and congratulations on Larkin Street's recent anniversary. Great, thank you. Hello, my name is Shamanique Jones and I am a participant in the THP program of Alameda County through um, Pivotal Point Youth Services. Um, I first moved into the program um, two years ago, um, and I'm about to graduate from the program. Um, if it wasn't for the TH program, uh, TH, THP program, 
I wouldn't have nowhere to go. I have a two-year-old daughter. If you do the math, I moved in as soon as I had my daughter. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have nowhere to go. And I'm very appreciative of the program because it didn't help me to learn how to be an adult. You know, because I was 21 and then was not doing anything with my life. I'm now 24 years old, and now I know how to pay bills. I know how to um, make sure everything in my house is stable for the month or for the few months that I needed to be, and all that, all that type of stuff. And um, also, what I would like to say is that if you guys take the TAC program, see, I have brothers and sisters that's younger than me that's also in um, foster care, and if it's in we don't have our mother or our fathers to help us out, you know. So if you take this program, if they take the program away, what were my brothers and sisters then be able to go once they hit 18? So I pre, I really ask you guys to please consider not taking the THP program because it's really helpful for those of us that don't have no parents or no one to support us. Thank you. Thank have you, Miss nice Jones. Hi, uh, my name is Kelly Hunter. I work with Pivotal Point Youth Services in Oakland. And I just want to give a big up to all the youth that came and spoke. You guys rock. Thank you so much for participating in this process. And I hope you guys recognize the power in that. Um, the people that are sitting there paying attention to them and also the youth. It's huge. And um, it has a reciprocal effect. As you see, a lot of them go back into the field and continue this work. It's very powerful and it's very needed. And I also would like you guys to just visualize what it's gonna look like if you do take this away. Um, more monies will be necessary for law enforcement and a lot more monies than is being expended for this program. So I hope you take that into consideration and keep all the programs alive. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Why don't you pull that microphone right up to you? <laughs> there you go. Okay, my name is Tiana Nash. Um, I am a THP participant as well. Um, I wasn't going to get emotional, but you know, I have no choice. Uh, this is a very serious matter to me. And I'm, I have been in the program for two years. I am exiting. I have a daughter. And without this program, <sighs> I don't want to imagine how or where me and my daughter would be. Um, a good thing about this program is it, it taught me structure in my life. It taught me how to, to speak. It taught me how to communicate and get a job, do my resumes. I mean, it's, it's remarkable the things that I can do now as I look back in the past that I couldn't even accomplish. And now, that I'm exiting, I have a, a wonderful job. I work for Alameda County Foster Youth Alliance, and I'm 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 proud proud to say that I work for them because I feel like I'm giving back to the same people that went through the same things as me. And um, to close it out, I just want to say and echo everybody else: um, please keep it in process, keep it going forward, and just keep helping out the youth because. A lot of the, a lot of the youth that have received the THP, they I mean they're they're stretching their life further, and they're accomplishing their goals. And if I feel if you take it away, then the goals of the young people are going to be crushed. And we don't want a lot of young people crushed. So no, we don't. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you, Ms. Nash. This is a great story. Thanks. Um, so my name is Reed Cannell. I'm the executive director of the Alameda County Foster Youth Alliance. And I think that clearly we've heard everything that we need to hear. Um, and I'm excited to see that we'll hear several more strong voices here. Um, I just want to say, you know, we, the Foster Youth Alliance, are a coalition of 31 agencies that work with transition age foster youth in Alameda County, including all six of the transitional, the THP plus transitional housing providers. And so uh, I'm here today to make sure that, that you're able to hear our unified voice that opposes any and all cuts to THP plus. So uh, thanks for the time, and we trust based on your comments, your record, um, and the you know kind of compelling stories that we know that you've heard that you will champion our cause in you know negotiation with your colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Bernardo Berto. I'm from Stanislaus County. Um, I am a current THP Plus participant. Um, 
Before that, I was also um, working in San Francisco at Morgan Lewis and Bacchus, one of the largest um, law firms in America. Um, after that, I had gone to the United States Army, and then I had got out, and I had came into THP Plus. Um, without THP Plus, I don't think I'd probably be where I'm at. Um, I went back with the foster parents that I live with from 1997 until current. Um, I'm still living there. I have a great job. Um, I'm still in it. Um, it's coming to an end, but it's not just for me that I'm advocating for. It's for the other foster youth that are also in foster care. I have younger foster brothers and sisters, although they're not my birth family, they are my family. Um, I mean, a wise person once said that it's not who birthed you, it's who nurtured you, that's your family. And to take away THP Plus would be taking away another part of your family. Mm, that's about it. Thank, Thank you, Bernard. sir. And hello, my name is Nai Se Chow, and I am from Merced County THP program. And I am just here also to oppose the complete elimination of our program. And um, without it, like everybody else said, I, I'd be homeless and furthering my education wouldn't even be in the question. I'm currently right now going to CSU Stanislaus, um, getting my BS degree in biological science and, res and hopefully getting a career in pharmacy. And, um, you know, I have, like everybody else, uh, seven other brothers and sisters who are also formerly in foster care and without the program, you know, they wouldn't also have opportunity. Um, and, you know, like, you know, the statistics, 1,400 youths in California are going to be emancipating each year. In Merced County, there's 40 youths emancipating or more each year. Um, and in Merced County, there's just eight slots also for the THB program. And... Um, you know, but without the program, our lives would definitely change dramatically. You know, we would have, we don't have a support system. You know, we don't have anything to fall back on. We're not like other, you know, youths and younger and, you know, young adults who have a family to support them in that work system. We don't have that. And um, we cannot go back home. THP program is our home. THP program is our network system. You know, that is our support system. So, you know, I'm just going to keep it short and say just, you know, please oppose, you know, oppose elimination of our program. So thank you. Continued success with your science studies. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Christina Gonzalez. I'm from Santa Cruz County. And just like everyone said that I'd be homeless too and I don't know what I would do. I don't want to know. <laughs> I don't know what I would do if I was homeless. And so please try your best to save our program. Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez. Hi, my name is Michael Davis. Uh, I'm a current graduate of the THP Plus program, and I'm a current undergrad at the University of California, Santa Cruz, majoring in biology. Um, THP has helped me uh, both stay in school, and without them, I would not be able to afford to live in Santa Cruz County. Um, I also got three jobs working with uh, THP. They helped me. Um, get a job as an in-home respite provider for a child with autism, a uh, lifeguarding job, and they're helping me um, build a small business uh, around giving music lessons, and um, without them, that wouldn't be possible. So uh, I just want to say thank you for supporting us. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Leno. My name is Michelle Burns. I'm with the John Burton Foundation, and you've heard um, really from the best representatives so many of the young people in THP Plus. So I'll make my comments very brief. Um, but I did want to speak very briefly to the effect of the $5 million cut that was already enacted for the current fiscal year. It's kind of an example of the type of um, effect it's going to have um, if the program were to be cut or eliminated. So what we've seen this year is as a result of the $5 million reduction that there are more than 300 fewer former foster youth being served than there were last year. And what you've heard from some service providers is that it has forced um, them to significantly reduce staff that provide essential social services to the youth living in THP+. Um, what we're also seeing is that service providers are no longer filling their vacancies. So that means that youth that are on the cusp of being discharged from the child welfare system are doing so without any viable housing options, and those older young people that have already left care um, are continuing to be without a stable place to live because there's no room within THP+. 
So obviously that um, picture would change much more dramatically with any, the elimination of the program. Um, all of the current participants would immediately become homeless, but any additional reduction would mean um, continued uh, destruction for the young people who are in the program and for the many thousands of young people behind them. So I did want to just acknowledge that and also again echo the comments that this is certainly part of the larger child welfare picture and we are um, very proud to be part of the coalition of protect our children protect our future to really um, fight any additional uh, cuts to child welfare including thp plus so thank you very much thank you Ms. burns <clears throat> my name is hannah haley i'm also with the john burton foundation and i am a graduate student of social work at the University of California, Berkeley. And I just am another voice in the chorus uh, stressing how important this program is and thanking you for your time and attention today. Thank you, Ms. Haley. I'm Simone Turek, also with the John Burton Foundation and also a um, current social welfare student at UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, I'm also coming to you as someone who worked in the foster care system for a number of years um, with emancipating youth um, prior to going back to school. And so I, I would say I'm speaking from, um, from someone who's emotionally tied to, to, to this cause in the sense that I've seen people be directly affected um, by uh, emancipating from the system with, with you know, lacking support. Um, and also just um, being with the John Burton Foundation and part of this coalition, Protect Our Children, Protect Our Future, um, it's really important to me that THP Plus stays in the budget. And um, just, just to stress, um, I know that we've all heard a number of, you know, we've heard data, we've heard personal stories. Um, I just want to point out that the monumentous effect that, that eliminating THP Plus would have on on current, um, you, you heard from a number, number of youth, current you know, youth in the program as well as those who would have benefited from it in the future and that will need it. The huge, you know, that impact is huge and to compare that to the minuscule um, short term, and it is only short term, um, state savings that we would get, I mean it just, it's not, it, it, it's not common sense, you know, and I just don't see, I don't see a sensible reason to, to cut the program. Thank you, Ms. Turk. Uh, my name is Tish Silva. Um, I'm a clinical social worker at BAYC Support Housing Program. Um, I'm also um, an alumni of California's foster care system and have returned um, to, to give back to my community and who I see as my family. Um, and my emancipation happened during a time when there was none of this. I'm, I'm almost 30 now. Um, and it was a bus pass and, and good luck. Um, and you know, this, this is not the legacy I want to see left to the kids I work with and the kids that come after them. Um, it, it was not a time that went well for myself or my brothers, um, and we continued to struggle with having a supportive network in our lives. Um, so my kids work really hard, and they're asking for really basic needs to be met, housing, food, clothing, safety, um, and, and I think it's really our responsibility to provide that um, as, as alumni coming back and and as legislators and as clinicians and executive directors and, and, and whoever works with them. So I would really appreciate your ongoing support um, for my youth. Thank you, Ms. Silva. Keep up your good work. Good afternoon, my name is Rachel Sutton and I too am a clinical social worker with BAYC, which is a nonprofit organization based in Hayward, California, part of Alameda County. Um, Tish and I actually are the two clinical social workers that serve approximately 20 youth um, and we have waiting lists. And I really wanted to humanize the direct service um, perspective and really highlight how incredibly hard our youth work and we are out in the communities every single day working on all facets of who they are as people. Everything from job to education but also their overall emotional and psychological well-being that was really tainted as a result of so many traumas they had to endure that was not their choice. Um, so I, I really um, thank you for your for your support on so many issues in regards to foster youth and um, really really encourage you to continue to support this program. Um, it's done incredible things for for the youth that I've worked with, and I think we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sutton. Greetings, good afternoon. Um, my name is Marion Owens. I'm the lead case manager with Larkin Street Youth Program, Lease Program. I am also one who is uh, one of the staff that pioneered the Lease Program uh, with Larkin Street. I'm also the first point of contact. I think the program 
I've, if you've heard the table today, there's been so many success stories. I was listening at uh, John Barton for uh, John Burton Ford Foundation, and just what they were talking about the stats. Last year, we had a big conference in LA regarding the THP Plus program. I was really excited, and just to hear that now the program is about to be cut. It's we're there for those youth. We're there to make the difference. We're there to be the models. They are our future. We have to nourish them. We need to mold them. I, I just can't see why this was even on the table. So it's great. I just wanted to get my voice heard and just be the difference with our youth. And thank you for supporting this. Thank you, Ms. Owens. Mm -hmm. Hello, Senators. Uh, my name is Luis Madrid, and I'm the manager for THP in Merced County. Uh, and I think everyone has already kind of spoken about the data and the advantages in the personal story. So I just want to back up a little bit and just share something that I think will give us a visual picture of the severity and the gravity of the pro, um, problem. But uh, up till May of 2009, I was a social worker for uh, Child Protective Services in Merced County um, and for the Permanent Planning Unit, which is the unit where we have the youth that are in long-term foster care that were never adopted or reunified. Uh, and part of our jobs was to plan the transition for these youth into successful you know, young adults. But uh, what was happening is that I had almost 70 cases I had um, two in Arizona, one in Texas, uh, and then one in Michigan, and then the rest scattered throughout California. Uh, we were responsible to, you know, visit them once a month. So, you know, if you do the math, there's every month has 30 days. There's no way that we can do it. Uh, so the transition is often very poor because we are so overwhelmed. Uh, 70 cases humanly is not possible to manage, and what ends up happening a lot of the times is that, you know, do you have the final court report? You know, you ask the kid, the youth, you know, do you have somewhere to go? A lot of the times, you know, just like any other question, they'll just say yes. That makes the social worker feel good, although we might feel that this is not no solid plan, but at least it kind of gives you some kind of peace of mind, although we know it's not realistic. So uh, in THP Plus, we pick them up where foster care has failed them and has left them on their own. It's an amazing program. Um, you know, just uh, uh, in conclusion, here in California, approximately 5,000 foster youth emancipate every year. And on a state level, we only have 1,400 slots. So I'm very, very surprised that um, they would see proposed to eliminate. You know, we should be seeing it grow to meet the needs of our youth. And thank you so much for your support. Thank you, Mr. Madrid. Good afternoon. My name is Camille Schrader. I'm the founder and director of Redwood Children's Services in Lake and Mendocino counties. And um, I am also a graduate of the foster care and group home system in the 80s when you did not have this. So I feel very emotionally passionate about the work that THP Plus has been able to do in the lives of the youth that we work with. Um, I would like to say that I I'm speaking to the issue of if you have a county share of cost. Um, counties are already in dreadful situation and anything that adds to a voluntary program with the county share of cost will be a cut to the THP Plus program. It absolutely will be. They won't have much options. They're in serious disarray themselves and so the idea that there may be some sort of a alternate plan around a county share of cost will absolutely cut this program. So thank you. Thanks for making that point, Ms. Schrader. Our last speaker. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's all yours. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Chantal Johnson, and I'm representing California Youth Connection. Um, while I feel everything has really been exhausted, and you've heard from uh, the most important people, uh, I, I do want to say on behalf of the 30 chapters of CYC that we are now doing, the THP program is doing what the system could not for our foster youth, and cutting it would definitely uh, produce all the effects that they said. But we've also, I, I want us also to remember the hundreds of success stories that we have a foster youth that we've seen when the, our system is fully funded, and I ask you to do that today. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Johnson. Well, thanks to everyone for hanging in there with us through our long public comment period, and every voice is very important, and I think it goes without saying, you all put a very human face on the issues that we are dealing with, and that's greatly beneficial to the committee and appreciated. We're going to deal with the last couple of items that we have with the Department of Social Services. So, Mr. Garcia, feel free to rejoin us. Okay. Ms. Lopez. Thanks for your patience as well. Good afternoon. Eva Lopez from the Department of Social Services. Um, 
if you wish, since you had some specific questions, I would propose to go through each one of the questions and hopefully address the things that you're sure. interested in. For okay. the viewing public, we've moved to page, pages 28, 29, um, where and the questions your, are. Yes. In your questions, you're asking in terms of the um, how the department is prioritizing the assignments of the 12 new positions. In addition to that, you're asking how much of their work is at one time in nature. Um, to address the second question first, it, it is not one time in nature. The reforms that passed through the last legislative process were permanent workload and permanent activities. Um, however, in terms of prioritizing, as you probably know and you have included in your agenda, there's um, a tremendous amount of activities that are part of the reform. And the staff that are been currently working through that, which includes the 12 positions, um, are working on the home visits, the protocols, the processes that um, we're embarking on. Um, we have put together a very uh, concise work plan because we need to ensure that we're meeting the time frames that are included in the statute, um, ensuring that we're uh, providing sufficient resources to address the stakeholder processes that we're dealing with now, ensuring that we're working with the counties as we're proceeding with the, the reforms themselves. So when you say what are we doing to prioritize, we, we have the work plan in place, we've looked at the statute in terms of their mandates, ensuring that we're meeting every one of those activities. So um, we have endeavored to prioritize everything that needs to be done. Um, and where is that work plan? I'm sorry, excuse me? Where is the work plan? Um, we have um, a work plan that we would be more than happy to share. Um, I thought we had shared it, but if, if we didn't, you know, we have something that's outlined in terms of everything that we're, we've been doing in the timelines and that, that we need to do. Why don't you provide the work plan to the committee? Oh, not a problem. Thank you. Not a problem. Um, in terms of the um, positions that are tied to the pro uh, provider enrollment, the appeal process, um, you had specifically asked what those folks are currently doing. Um, in addition to that, you asked how many appeals have been filed to date. So with that, um, the staff that we currently have, which are six, and all of the staff that we're talking about have been, you know, have been um, budgeted for, and in, um, we've already hired, and they're filled. Um, these folks are conducting the administrative reviews of, um, of appeal requests filed by the prospective or current IHSS provider who has been deemed ineligible by the county social, social services um, department or a public authority to be an IHSS provider. The final determination regarding an appeal is based on a written review process of 90 days and is based on review of various documents and co correspondence provided by the county or public by the county or the public authority and any new information received from a prospective or current IHSS provider or other government agency. Um, they look at extra extracted exclusionary crimes, and right now it's the three enumerated information from the Department of Justice, including the CORI information that we receive from the Department of Justice. Um, any other documentation uh, supporting the county or the public authority's decision, as well as the county or public authority written summary of their decision. Staff currently uses our current legacy system, which is our CMIP system, case management information payroll system, to obtain any additional information pertaining to the provider. Um, we currently, the appeal staff work very closely with our policy staff as well as legal as we um, continue to address some of the issues. This is a new process for all, so we are working in conjunction with them. Um, in addition, upon the completion of its review, the uh, staff might either can either uphold or reverse the, um, the action that was taken by the county. Um, at that point, um, when we receive appeals, and currently, um, as of yesterday, we have 19 appeals now. So we've grown out of, from 14 to 19? It, it went from 14 to 19, and that was as of yesterday. Okay. Now that's out of 117 providers that have currently been found to be ineligible. Keep it in mind that as we're tracking the provider enrollment process, uh, currently we have about um, 72,000 that are in the pending uh, cycle. Um, and of another number of folks that have already been enrolled. And I think the important piece here is that although we only have the 19 appeals, we need to be mindful that we have 31,000 that have been enrolled, which is where the, and, and that's where 117 plays into it, that as well. And we have 72,000 that are in the 
in the pending category. And, and we still have, as you know, um, approximately 380,000 providers that we will have to go through the system. So I wanna make sure that as we're looking at those numbers that we're not thinking, gosh, maybe there is not the, the um, activity that will necessitate the resource. So help me with this, Ms. Sure. Lopez. Isn't that what the 42 new hires from last year are supposed to be attending to, the integrity of the system? The 42, um, 30 of those 42 are investigators at the Department of Healthcare Services. There was the 12, which is the 12 that we're, we're speaking of in terms of the, the appeal process plus the other activities that we're dealing with in terms of the protocols, the unannounced visits, targeted mailings, et cetera. So I can only speak to the 12 out of the 42. Okay. Um, so of the 12, six are in, the, in terms of the appeal process. And although we have 19 appeals so far, of the 117 that have found, been found ineligible, Again, when we're looking at the number of providers that will have to go through the process, which is the 380,000 providers, I want to um, make sure that we're clear that the 19 we're envisioning will continue to grow in the activities that the staff are currently already doing. And why don't we just, uh, since we've already taken our action on this, uh, how, where did the funding come from? Actually, I'll take that one. Nick Buchan, Department of Finance. Um, so as Ms. Lopez described, she was referring to the 12 positions that were included in the budget. Um, the six additional positions, um, the resources were not included in, in the budget for, for them. And um, the Department of Finance recognized that the workload is there and um, also recognized the department would not be able to absorb those um, positions within existing resources. So um, we actually um, found a creative solution to get by for one year and that was um, by utilizing um, savings from the furloughs instead of um, scoring the full amount of savings and um, sending that to the controller's office in it, through an executive order to have them reduce the department's budget. We didn't reduce it by the amount, uh, the cost of those six positions, and the department was able to administratively establish them for one year. I have to tell you, the concept of paying for new hires with savings from furloughs is about one of the most nonsensical things I've ever heard of. You might want to talk to the governor about his furlough program. Just dumbfounding. Um, LEO, comments? Considering that this is a new workload associated with sort of the new anti-fraud activities, we, we would suggest considering making these positions limited term if you were to authorize them to give us that ability to, to look back and, and evaluate ongoing workload at a future point. Um, and are we gonna talk about the study later? Or do you want us to weigh in on that now? Please proceed. Um, in regards to the study, I think our thoughts here are that given sort of the cost of how, how much this would actually cost to run this study, I think we're concerned with whether or not the language is going to result in a report that really lets you evaluate which parts of the anti-fraud activities resulted in savings and which ones didn't. So we would want to work on the language and if, if staff is uh, willing to do so or in, interested in doing so at all, we would to make sure that that report comes back with um, some information about which which activities were the most efficient activities and the, the best use of the funds. And do you know how we arrived at the $500,000 figure? Um, I, I think the department would be able to elaborate. I think it had to do somewhat with um, other contracts that yeah. they've had in, uh, for the similar studies. If I may, sure. um, over the last five years, we've had extensive work with uh, CSUS in terms of all the studies that we've been conducting in the in-home supportive services area, specifically hourly task guidelines, um, as we were moving with our quality assurance activities. So um, because of the experience, the 500,000 was an estimate at the, at the time when we were building the budget. Uh, we have been meeting with CSUS to start to put together because as you know the report, um, the legislative report that we're speaking of is, was put in the statute and it's due in December of this coming year. Um, and because of the um, tremendous amount of information that we're going to have to include in this report um, in working with the counties, we will be working with CSUS to putting all that information together um, to try to bring forward to you some type of report that provides you all that information that is being of interest. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lopez. 
So uh, we've already taken our action, of course. We've rejected the six positions, but I see we have some folks here who'd like to speak uh, with regard to this item. And keep in mind, the item is on the six positions, not on all of the ongoing story of IHSS. Uh, I understand that. Karen Kiesler on behalf of the California Association of Public Authorities, and as Ms. Um, Lopez said, the public authorities are partner partnering with the counties um, throughout the state to try to make the provider enrollment procedures work, and we certainly understand their need for additional positions, um, so we're not actually weighing in in support or oppose, but there are a couple of things I want to um, bring to your attention. You know, my mom always said, do one thing at a time and do it well, and they're trying to do a whole bunch of different things, and they're not being done well, and you had oversight hearings on that. One of the really important dates that's like right ahead of us is April 1st, where the law requires that there be fingerprinting of consumers. And the, the, the um, anxiety, the fear about that is just palpable. Um, there was a conference call just yesterday that the department had with a broad IHSS stakeholder community, and they talked about their process to develop um, protocols, policies, and procedures as required by the law. And while we do have six public authorities that will be part of a smaller technical work group, we don't think that it's a great idea that consumers and worker representatives are being left out of that process. And we felt pretty strongly that the legislature's intent was to include consumer and worker representatives. To the extent that you can remedy that here by nudge or other action, we would urge you to do that. Thank you, Ms. Kiesler. Ms. Lopez, can you respond to that? Yes, we can. Um, as we stated yesterday during the conference call, our intent is to have stakeholder um, participation and input. It's an inclusive process. What we're doing, and based on many years of experience over the quality assurance process, what we're doing now is we're breaking out the stakeholder process into different components. The the first component that occurred yesterday, which was the, the bigger stakeholder teleconference in which we spoke to what the process would be. The second piece will be coming up this Monday, which is a smaller subgroup, which is some of the government, our government partners, as we're working through having some discussions on the work groups, the rolling up the sleeves uh, and putting something together. The next step will be, as we're putting the, that information together, we will come back to the bigger stakeholder process and share with them all of the protocols that we come with for recommendation so and draft form. At the, as you call it, the bigger stakeholder uh -huh, group, uh -huh. you d don't have intention of including providers and uh, recipients? On the stakeholder group? On the bigger, yes, absolutely. That, that there will, there are part of that process. Okay. We will be sharing whatever draft materials we come up with. And at the subgroup? And the subgroup will be, we have public authorities, we have uh, county welfare departments, we have w welfare fraud investigators, we have um, participants from the district attorney's office, we have um, the um, participants from the, the different, um, I'm trying, I'm losing time, the Department of Healthcare Services. So that is the smaller group putting, you know, starting our discussions. Whatever products come from that group then comes back All to right. the bigger group will be shared, comments will be received, input. Okay, very okay. good. Deborah Doctor from Disability Rights California, and I want to echo what Karen said. There's a substantive difference between being included at the table and being included in the audience. And the process, I understand that they're talking about including the stakeholders, the big group that I include myself in, after the working group has developed some materials. And I found it profoundly demeaning yesterday to hear on this phone call that we're not going to be at the table because we're not the experts and that it's more efficient to not have consumers and workers at the table. And those were words in that were subgroup. used. Pardon? You're saying in the subgroups. It, in the initial group that's going to start off. And the reason it so surprised me was because we worked so closely and so hard uh, on the hourly task guideline process and other parts of the quality assurance. And there were people who brought up on the call that it doesn't seem efficient to not include people at the beginning when they could lend you, we feel their expertise, because we feel like consumers and workers are the experts on this program. They know at least as much about the issues around unannounced home visits as do a district attorney, for instance. Um, so it, 
I think every, almost everybody who spoke on that call yesterday spoke uh, in opposition to the stakeholder plan here, and I want to make my comments on the record for that as well. Um, I want to commend staff for the analysis here and, and point out that so far, the people who have been found ineligible, it's one third of one percent. So when the time for your cost benefit analysis comes that you've been referring to several times today, it will be interesting to see what the cost has been so far and if this percentage of one third of one percent continues. And one third of one percent are the workers who have been found ineligible, which does not mean, as far as I know, because it's not indicated on the website, that they're ineligible because of criminal background problems. They could be ineligible because I don't know, they couldn't work for some other reason or the consumer that they were going to work for died or some other reason. So I'm not even sure that it is even one third of one percent who are being found ineligible. And lastly, although I know it's not the subject today, but when you talk about cost benefit analysis, I hope the $5,000 cameras are on the table for analysis. All Thank right. you. Thank you, Ms. Doctor. Mr. Meyer, I believe you're it. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. My, my last but not least, but I guess there's one more. Uh, as you know, I'm a consumer of IHSS, and I've uh, heard about this fraud issue. And I, I'm just wondering, just from a, a very basic question, how much fraud have you actually found in the program, dollar-wise? How many people are really involved versus the 365,000 workers? and over 400,000 recipients of IHSS. And are you just, is there just a lot of fluff going on here? Is there some re real reality? And how much money is being spent and waste of time and energy and, and the angst that goes on when people are concerned about unannounced visits and people coming to your home with badges saying, I'm here to uh, uh, check on something. Uh, I, I just wonder where this is going. Is this the Escapo or something like that? Uh, I, I, I just don't like the sounds of it. And I'm wondering if this is really what our business should be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. I take your questions as rhetorical, but I think the answer really is that this is a singular obsession of this particular governor, certainly not of the legislature. Thank you. Mr. Rage, we will give you the last word. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Chair. I apologize. I heard the joy in your voice when you thought that Mr. Myers was the last testimony. <laughs> uh, uh, um, but, you know, I, I'll play Frank Mecca for today. Um, one of the things that I would like for you to do while taking into consideration these staffing positions um, due to the demand on workload is also think about the social workers who are asked to be laid off. Um, they also have workload issues. And our fear is that with all the new anti-fraud implementations that are going on, there's bottlenecking occurring. So while you do a thorough review of whether or not these positions are justified, please do the same with social workers. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. So uh, we are near the end of our hearing with the action already taken. On the uh, bottom of page 11, moving on to page 12, we have uh, IHSS Conlon versus Shuri positions. And there's just one question. If you'd like to respond briefly, then we can conclude the meeting. Yes. Um, the normal process for the Conlon claims um, is for those claims to be sent directly to the uh, Beneficiary Service Center. Once they receive and they process them, they then they forward over to the Department of Social Services for review. The Conlin process has been um, something that we've been dealing and grappling with um, based on a number of years of experience as the claims are coming in. And um, now that we're looking at our current process um, and it's been already in place, we are seeing that there has been a number of, an increased number of claims from the last time we came to you when we were asking for staff. Right now we have about 401 claims that are pending adjudication. The average processing time for these claims is anywhere between 12 to 20 hours each. The court ordered time frame for processing these claims is only 120 days. Currently claims are being processed by the department within four to seven months of receipt instead of the 120 day court order time frame. Um, and of course, 
uh, what happens for ev if we're over the 120 days, we are liable for a penalty of up to $1,000 for each claim process beyond that 120 day time frame. Um, uh, some of the things that the staff need to do as they're reviewing all of these claims is reviewing the claim packet for completeness, notifying the Department of Healthcare Services for any missing assignment, sending an acknowledgement letter to the recipient, letting them know that we have received their information, researching the recipient and provider history in multiple databases, contacting the recipient and counties for any additional information that is needed, obtaining supporting documentation from the recipient, interpreting program policies, analyzing all of the data, um, calculating the payment rate, determining the appropriate claim disposition, entering the information into the electronic claim system because we have to put something together to track as this is a court order and we're mandated to ensure that we're proving to the courts that we're doing what we need to do. Uh, sending the notice of action to the, the recipient, preparing the position statements if we're going to deny any of these claims, and uh, um, attend state hearings because these individuals are eligible for an appeal process, and responding to the telephone inquiries. We have reached a point now because of the number of claims that are backing, uh, coming in and because of the claims that are just sitting there in backlog that we are coming in and asking for the additional staff. Are furloughs exacerbating the situation? You know, as every other State Department who is dealing with furloughs, we are trying to prioritize and ensuring that we're working through the processes um, and we're wanting to ensure that we meet all of our time frames. We're dealing with it the best way we can. Um, I think furloughs are, are impacting everyone who's involved, but we're trying to ensure that we're meeting our time frames, that we're meeting our requirements. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. I understand you're going to be moving on. Yes, I am. Well, we yes, wish I am. you success and we thank you for all of your great service. Thank you so much. All right. LAO, any comments on this? We have no concerns with this proposal. Okay. Well, we're going to be leaving this open for now. So that does conclude our business today. Thank you for your participation. We are adjourned.